So if you're a fan of the show, I know you probably took a look at this title, Ready to Attack. Relax. Dan it, Dan it. Dan it, Dan it, Dan it, Dan it, Dan it. I like that. It's going to be my Dan new theme Dan song. Dan it, Dan it, Dan it, Dan it, Dan it, Batman. <laughs> a number of you have wanted me to do this video. Some asked long ago and were excited when I announced that it would finally be happening. Still, weeks went by and nothing. But none of that matters because now we're here. The Blush Bunnies present Never Have I Ever. Going into watching another Netflix teen dramedy, I had high hopes this time around because I knew that one of its executive producers came from one of the best shows to ever exist. Mindy Kaling, also lovingly known as Kelly Kapoor, has developed a rather trustworthy rep for writing and producing on said show, so Never Have I Ever has to be good, right? Hmm. Well, let me set the scene. This show probably has one of the wildest setups I've seen in a while. Davy's parents moved to America, and I mean, timing couldn't be any worse. Her dad dies at her music recital, and she suffers from some form of PTSD, which lands her wheelchair bound. I felt bad for Davy, but I'm like, man, why he had to die? That man know he fine. But we get him in flashbacks, so I'll take that. Davy unfortunately has a problem that many of us experience in high school, and that's not really realizing who you really are until, well, much later. Davy's grand idea for making this school year count is by going through a list of cool things and checking them off one by one. You know, so she and her friends can be popular because the only thing that matters in high school is popularity. And it definitely matters after you graduate. Definitely. Her outcast friend group, or the UN, which we'll get into that later, comprises of Fabiola and Eleanor, a mixed girl who has no desire to be desirable with a very strange obsession with the school's janitor, and then another Asian girl who is a quirky theater kid. Davy decides that one of the must-dos on the road to popularity is to get a boyfriend, and she takes the liberty of assigning everyone a guy. She assigns herself a gay boy, knowingly, to gain eyeballs. But but upon finding out from her arch nemesis that people aren't calling them the UN to be racist, but to say no one wants them, you know, and they, um, to have, uh, um, hmm. Nobody wants to bake cookies with them. Davy gets the bright idea that she must combat this. This can't be what people think of me. I can't allow it. I won't. You know what? I got it. I'll have sex with the hottest guy in school. <sighs> So I'm trying to connect with Davy, right? And I completely get it that she's going on what she feels and what she deems beautiful, yada yada. But I'm like, girl, you're doing the absolute most. And Mr. Hunk of Burning Love over here is just like, okay, you wanna have sex? Cool, I'm down, let me write you in my calendar. Even the most hot and ready guys are gonna ask like, wait, you wanna do what? I guess in order to understand where all of this came from, we have to take a closer look at these characters. Let's start with Davy. Many people, including some of you blush bunnies, have mentioned you liked the show, but Davy just wasn't doing it for you. She's a brat, she's annoying, she's unlikable. I get it. To the naked eye, I see all of that. However, comma, follow me down the rabbit hole with this one. When we first meet Davy, we learn about her father's passing. She's in therapy, and on top of coming into her own as a young woman, she's grieving. You might say she's grieving, but that's no reason to be an a-hole. To that I say, you're right. But keep in mind, not only are there many stages of grief, people also grieve in different ways. Shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, acceptance are the steps. I think it's safe to say Davy's somewhere between denial and anger throughout the series. Shock comes when it first happened and she became psychosomatic then she has her denial stage which quickly becomes evident in the way that her dad comes to her not the fact that she sees him in her dreams but what he says and her actions that follow you died oh god i'm better now I'm better now. Spoken as if he had the flu and had just gotten over it. Which implies that subconsciously, Davy still hasn't accepted that he's no longer there. That she can't just walk in the living room and see him watching his favorite tennis player. That she in some way wants him to come back. It's important to note in this dream, she also asked him if she was ugly. This is significant because this whole story unfolds because of how she views herself. And you may be saying to yourself, well, no. Ben said she was um 
unbakeable. She never referred to herself this way. True, however, comma, if that's not something you feel about yourself, no one, especially not a little dweeb like Ben, can make you even fathom the thought. After he reassures her, she follows up with, no, Kamala is beautiful, which introduces a major problem with this series. Because clearly she's beautiful, but she doesn't think so because her standard of beauty is deeply influenced by societal measures. Additionally, Davy is a brown girl and her cousin is noticeably lighter than her. You know, the whole fair skin equals beauty paradigm. It made me think about this video I came across not too long ago and one thing stood out to me. It's all about how media portrays the skin color of a heroine or hero. They try to make them look really fair and we as a youth want to look like that because we consider that okay this is shown as attractive so we consider that as a standard and go by that. This first season missed a huge opportunity to use its platform to show a broader definition of beauty. Now some of you may be thinking one show is not going to erase a lifetime of beauty issues within the Indian culture or any culture for that matter and that's true but we have to start from somewhere. And don't even get me started on the if you're smart, that means you're ugly trope that has a chokehold on the industry. That's a whole nother video. Anyways, back to the story. Davy awakens from her dream and her grief journal is sitting on her nightstand. She throws it on the floor. Not feeling the need or want to write about her dream to me shows denial, resistance to her new reality. I know some of you are like, yeah, but she's still a brat. Hmm, maybe, but let's keep going. She finds out that Eleanor has a boyfriend by walking in on she and her boyfriend and kissing. Now, to be fair, it can be a bit jarring when your friends are leading lives that you're completely oblivious to, though Davy did have a rather dramatic reaction. <coughs> Eleanor's whole thing was, you're going through a lot, so I don't want this to be the cherry on top, which is sweet that she took her feelings into consideration. So it's rather odd that this would cause an emergency meeting with her therapist who posed the question, what can you do to make you succeed at something? make you feel good about yourself. Getting the hottest guy in school, that's the answer. I don't know him, he doesn't know I exist, but this is definitely the answer for sure. She tells her therapist this, who has said herself the only reason she was even hired was to help her through the sudden loss of her father. But instead of getting the therapy everyone thinks she needs, she talks about giving the cookies to Paxton. And this is the first thing she writes in her grief journal. Sounds like filling a void to me, but according to Davy, what's there to talk about? He's dead, it made me sad. Let's take it a step further. On her first day back in band, her teacher so eloquently brings up her father's death. Davy has an emotional breakdown. She doesn't cry. She doesn't scream. Instead, she runs out of the class and into Paxton's bed. Well, his garage. Her longing for Paxton is deeply tied to her avoiding her feelings about her dad. Filling the void within herself of having something that she, because she is in the UN, should not be privileged to have. Because this is not something she is truly ready for, she makes up an excuse to leave and finds what? Her mother. Selling her father's motor pad. Crap. There goes those feelings she's been desperately trying to avoid. And what does she do to deal with her bitch of a mother? Her words, not mine. She takes a pop quiz to map out her bakery date with Paxton. That's not weird at all. I mean, I don't know, is it just me or are kids not as they're portrayed in these TV shows? Anywho, here's the part that confuses me. After Davy's plan to bake cookies with Paxton crumbles, Fabiola and Eleanor assume that something happened, but instead of her telling her friends the truth, she keeps the lie going. Now, this decision would have made since had she, one, not already made this plan of finessing her way into popularity with these same friends, and two, had she not just been complaining that they were keeping things from her? Like, what happened to the whole friends shouldn't keep secrets and trust that they can handle certain situations speech? I guess that doesn't apply when it's something that Davey wants to be deceptive about, huh? Go figure. But funnily enough, as soon as Paxton tells her it's not a good idea anymore for them to bake goods, she has another emotional breakdown while tending to her father's garden. Again, being forced to face the fact that he's no longer there. So she diverts to trying to cultivate a relationship with Paxton, this time while being his brainchild for a group project. Now at this point, she's literally grasping at straws trying to find any inkling that she may have a chance with him. And I'm just watching like, girl, give it up. So in the midst of still trying to get her chocolate chips dipped, <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate chip still. <laughs> what is what is that? <laughs> I don't know. Ignore me. Her father comes to her again. At least she strongly believes so. In the form of a coyote. 
Her therapist finds this to be a bit alarming. She knows that Davy isn't processing her grief well at all. I mean, she said her dad was a coyote for crying out loud, so do you blame her? She tells her, talk to this coyote daddy. Tell him how you feel. Well, the perfect opportunity comes when Davy is in shock that Paxton has no interest in her again. And the coyote daddy comes to cheer her up by attacking her. You know, life could be a lot easier for her if she was just writing her journal. The irony is that the coyote attack leads to her getting a follow from Paxton and he posted her on Instagram that's not really Instagram but is. And she becomes the talk of the school. A pseudo popularity going on. I guess coyote daddy did what needed to be done after all. Good job coyote daddy. Now remember earlier when I said this story unfolds because of how Davy views herself well, that becomes even more apparent in episode 4 when it is said as much as Davy wanted to be a chill girl you could have sex with, she knew the truth. She was a weird loser and a member of the UN and today certainly was not going to change that. The key word here is certainly because Ganesh Puja is the focus of the episode. This holiday requires Davy to dress in traditional garb. She's clearly uncomfortable and the word certainly puts emphasis on the fact that her Indian background does not make her feel attractive, worthy, or desirable. Not to mention she spends the whole day trying to mentally and emotionally detach herself from the culture. The bright side is she was given a different perspective when her friend talked about embracing the culture. You could see that she was really taking it in and things might eventually turn around for her but before we could even get there things began to unravel when she went on the model UN trip when the word spread about she and Paxton being fake intimate gets back to Paxton one of Davy's token character flaws gets kicked into high gear the lack of accountability had she told her friends the truth they would not have told Ben, who would not have blurted it out, which would not have led to a domino effect to spilling the hottest tea in school. But she just blames it all on Ben. And when she gets back to school, she completely shuts down any and everything that's been going on with her friends because she, quote, has the bigger sh now. Up until this moment, I've been linking all of her mishaps back to the death of her father and her struggles to grieve him. I know someone is thinking, no, you've just been making excuses for her. Oh, hush, nobody asked you. I've empathized with her, yes, but we're halfway through the season and she hasn't moved past her anger denial stage of grief. Not to say that there's a time limit on it, but at some point, something's gotta give. The world doesn't revolve around you and life doesn't stop for everyone else just because you're having a hard time processing your own. I hate to say it, but I see why people don't like her. After she gets off her high horse of nobody matters but me, Davy tries to redeem herself by throwing a slumber party and reuniting Eleanor with her mom. Ironic that reuniting them led to the ultimate fallout within their own relationship, but I mean, Davy really couldn't blame anyone but herself. She had plenty of time and opportunity to tell her friends the truth, but since the lie sounded better, she stuck with it. And for that, I really don't feel bad for her. To add insult to injury, right after she promises to do better, she ditches her friends for Paxton. It's like, okay, when is enough enough? Why keep doing the same things over and over expecting people to just accept it and forget? Homegirl has issues to say the least and I've just made it to the part of the show where her therapist tells her that everything she's doing is to fill the void of her dad. That's what I get for writing while watching instead of waiting till the end. And why am I even a YouTuber? Clearly, I've missed my calling. Anywho, after her friends finally go off on her, it doesn't even matter because she finally gets what she's been wanting from Paxton all along. What she's been obsessing over. Well, almost. First base is a start. But it doesn't change anything. It actually makes it worse. Now he wants nothing to do with her, her friends want nothing to do with her, and her mom is threatening to move back to India. All the while, she still refuses to deal with her father's death. A big ball of misery. But since she has been waiting in the rafters, he helps her to put the pieces back together again. Which brings me to the guy she's been ignoring him for, Paxton Hall Yoshida. The jock, the cool kid, the girls want him, the guys hate yet want to be like him. Typical. Um, I wish they would have done more with his character. The fact that his sausage is ready whenever she approaches the hot dog stand is a bit shallow to say the least. Like is this really how high school boys act? Speaking of high school boys, I guess we can address the elephant in the room now. Darren Barnett, who plays Paxton being 28 years old during the filming of the show, doesn't really bother me that much. I know, ew, gross. Well, this is how I look at it. Even in analyzing these TV shows and films, I personally always keep in mind that it's just that, a TV show 
or a film. This is not a biopic or based on a true story. It's a fictional work. The nature of the show has a sexual overtone, but they never take it too far with what we see on screen, specifically when it comes to Paxton and Davy. And to top it off, the show pokes fun at itself and says it clear as day how Hollywood always casts adults to play teen roles. The actors are also older than mom. I've been seeing a lot of chatter about his age online and I'm just like, eh. However, comma, what does make it problematic is that Maitre, who plays Davy, was presumably 17 during the filming. I do think that both actors should be age appropriate whenever something beyond holding hands is going on. Pairing an adult with someone who isn't legal is uncomfortable to say the least. There is a problem I'd like to address with Paxton's character and it was disappointing to see to be honest. They tried to make him seem less one dimensional by having a sister with special needs. The reason why I say that is because of this scene where Rebecca finds Davy and they spark up a conversation. Paxton finds them together and he's all, you said you were just going to the bathroom, what the hell? Then he feels all guilty like, what do you think, I'm hiding her or something? Davy's like, I didn't say that, you weirdo. Well, she didn't call him a weirdo, but you can tell she wanted to. Then later he explains that he's just protective of his sister. And I'm just like, so you guys want us to believe that Paxton seriously thought that Davy, this day was going to bully his sister or do something harmful to her. Like, why would this be his reaction? Now, it would be different if he actually walked in and Davy was being rude to her and he went into his protection mode, but it was completely unwarranted. A forced layer of, he's dealing with this thing with his sister, something he's had to do with his whole life. Meanwhile, Davy and Rebecca hit it off as soon as they met, so what are we talking about? They really could have done without that little tidbit. But after he apologizes for being a jerk, there's this moment where he looks at her like, hmm. Unfortunately, the thought doesn't last long after he asks her to be in his group for a class assignment so that she could do all the work and they could get a good grade. From this point forward, Paxton really isn't giving her much attention. He's nice to her, but not like a, I like you, nice. More of a, you're a human being, so why be mean kind of nice. This is evident after he calls her a friend after Coyote Daddy bites her and he rushes her to the hospital. Of course, that doesn't stop her from wanting something more, but before he can even fathom the thought of taking her out of the friend zone, he finds out about the whole sleeping with him lie that she told. Paxton being upset showed that he really regarded Davy as a friend and it was about the principle of what she had done. How could she be a real friend to him if she was willing to lie on him for personal gain? Hmm deep. Eventually he starts talking to her again and that leads to him rescuing her again and somehow that leads to a I like you kiss. Which is cute and all but nothing happened between them for him to all of a sudden take her out of the friend zone. It was kind of like he's the hot guy of the show so we have to make them a thing. Meanwhile on the opposite end of the spectrum there's Ben. Now I know I called Ben a dweeb earlier but maybe I was being a little harsh. He's not a dweeb. I'm lying, yes he is. Wait, what is a dweeb? Oh, yeah, he's a dweeb. So this dweeb has secretly liked Davy all of his life, but Max didn't hate. You know, the whole, if he's mean to you, he likes you thing we've all been taught, which is problematic in itself, but that's a whole nother video. With him being the one who coined the phrase to you in, I just knew that for the remainder of the season, he would be unlikable. To my surprise, that wasn't the case. We first see his soft spot for Davy after she says something that I'm not gonna repeat because YouTube might delete my page, but Ben, seeing that Davy was going through an emotional breakdown, he didn't press charges and empathize with her. I'm like, okay, so he's not going to be such a dweeb the whole time. Hmm, go on, I'm listening. It really lands when we get a peek into his home life. We find out that Angela from the office is his mother, so it's obviously gonna be downhill from there. His father puts work before everything. His girlfriend is a social media whore who uses him for financial status. You know, a good look for the gram. And he has no friends. Well, except for his housekeeper, Patty. Seeing what his typical day is like, you can't help but feel sorry for him. We see why everything is such a big deal with his schooling and why it bothered him so much when Davy stopped talking to him after they turned a new leaf in Model UN. Ben takes to Davy and her family because not only is he longing for a sense of family and community, but out of everyone in his life, Davy is the only person he really relates to. So it's only natural that he began to develop feelings for her even though she was so stuck on Paxton she couldn't see the signs. Other than that time he awkwardly tried to kiss her. Oh well, blame it on the henny. Or 
Grandma Juice. In the end, it worked out for him because, well, Davy opened her eyes. Which brings me to the person who wishes Davy would spend less time on boys and more time hitting the books. Dr. Nalini Vishwakumar. Now, I have to admit, when I began watching the series, I thought she was one of those overbearing traditional mothers who took little to no account of what was going on with their children. What she says goes, no if, ands, or buts about it. I left the season feeling this way as well, but the way it ended definitely added to what I thought of her, gave her an extra layer. At the beginning of the season, again, we find out her husband has passed. The husband that I'm sure convinced her after many conversations to move to America in pursuit of living the American American dream. I can almost bet that she'd much rather stay in India and raise her family, but this was a compromise she was willing to make in order to make her husband happy. Add to all of that the fact that Davy was a daddy's girl, and voila, we have ongoing friction. First with the school books, she kept badgering her about her schoolwork, then she talked about her being more like Kamala, which segue really quick into Kamala. Kamala's character gave the show a more traditional look into the Indian culture. The sole purpose of her character was to show the juxtaposition between American and Indian values. In the Indian culture, it's common for arranged marriages. In America, you kind of just get whatever leftovers you can find and hope for the best. Though Kamala is there for school, she's hoping to adapt to a more American lifestyle. The main thing being able to govern her own love life. Sneaking around with Steve and living vicariously through the cast of Riverdale is not quite how she imagined this happening. Alas, beggars can't be choosers. To her surprise, her soon-to-be husband is not an uggo, so that changes her outlook a bit. She's not so quick to shut him down, but she still stays true to herself in that she's not ready for marriage. Good for you, Kamala. But back to the mom. There was an ongoing cycle of be better, Davy, because you're not good enough. And in the midst of it all, we see her trying to move forward with her life, even though she hasn't properly grieved her husband. Sound familiar? This is evident when she attempts to sell the bike, but the memories of what it meant made her hold on to it. Although I think it was unfortunate that Davy not wanting her to sell it wasn't enough for her to keep it in the first place because it was clearly of sentimental value to her and her mom was like, too bad I'm selling it. It's not surprising that her father isn't the only thing Nalini has lack of empathy for. When Davy tries to tell her about how the teacher treated her at Ganesh Puja, her mom doesn't even listen to her side of the story. She just tells her how disappointed she is in her. The strains of this relationship run deep, honey. Deep. It doesn't help that Davy lies to her mother and is quite disrespectful, but as a parent, it's your job to create a safe space for your kids and not retaliate to their bad behavior by disowning them. It's an eye for an eye with these two. I think in the end, Nailini starts to realize it's okay to be the one to initiate their healing. But because this is Davy we're talking about, her mother is not the only relationship that was strained. Which brings me to the rest of the UN. These women are beautiful, so it's so cringe that they use the nerdy, undesirable trope. But anywho, in the first episode, Fabiola is presented as a nerdy tomboy. Well, you know what? I take that back because tomboys usually have style. Meanwhile, Fabiola walks around looking like Jake from State Farm. When Davy mentions getting boyfriends, she's not so on board with it. Fab has her eye on someone else a girl with style. She at the moment doesn't quite know what to do with these feelings, but I also get the feeling that this isn't the first time she's felt like this for another girl. In the show they say that it is, but I don't believe it. Because she's not ready to explore these feelings, she starts dating Alex Gomez, who she has not even the slightest interest in. Now here's where Fab's story gets interesting. She and her mom are at the nail salon, and her mom is trying to convince her to get a girly nail design. She starts fishing to see what boy Fab likes. Two things we learn from this scene. We know that her mom knows her daughter isn't straight, but is not ready to give up on the idea of her being into guys. And Fab doesn't feel comfortable being herself because of the expectations her mom has of her. That's something I think a lot of people can relate to. Luckily for her, she does have someone she can open up to. Well, someone in something. I don't want to discredit iRobot over here. Eleanor gives her the support, acceptance, and boost of confidence she's been longing for. Davy tries to squeeze her little support in there, and Fab is like, okay, girl, bye. Thankful, but unmoved. 
The moment that did touch her heart was when she finally came out to her mother. Though it wasn't necessarily on her own merit thanks to Joyce blurting it out, it went much better than she had anticipated. Her mother showed her a level of compassion that made her feel seen. She didn't have to live up to an expectation anymore because she was loved just the way she was. Then we have the last member of the UN. We don't get much into Eleanor's story until halfway into the series, which is a bummer because she has one of the most intriguing storylines. She's an aspiring actress who was being raised by her father because her mom, Joyce, took off when she was younger to pursue an acting career herself. Though her career is obviously not going as planned, Eleanor still holds her in high regards and doesn't blame her for leaving. She's better than me because I would not be excited to show a postcard my mom sent me after years of not being there. But it's the little things that count I guess. So there's that. Paxton blindsides her when he tells her that her mom was his waitress the night before. And because her mom is supposed to be performing on a cruise ship off the coast of Mexico, Eleanor was pretty defensive to say the least. But when she finally talks to her, all of the hurt and disappointment that she felt about being deceived went out the window. That is, until she realized her mother didn't really want to connect with her. Instead of looking at the upside of building that relationship with her daughter, Joyce decided it was a chance for her to try out Hollywood. And instead of her nurturing her daughter's career, Joyce not being able to accept the reality that her daughter has more talent in her pinky toe than she would ever possess, she just packs up and leaves. Eleanor's talent was the motivation she needed to continue her non-existent career perfect example of a deadbeat mother. So Eleanor choosing to quit acting was completely understandable. Everything about pursuing acting reminded her of her crappy mom and she wanted to rid herself of that pain and detach. She didn't take her personal problems out on other people. She just dealt with it the best way she knew how. Eleanor needs to holla at her homegirl because um, she could use a little of that. Just a smidge. So. Would I recommend this show? Oh, before I get to that, there's somebody I want to introduce to you guys. She's kind of nervous. She's like, what if they don't like me? And I'm like, girl, if they like me, they're gonna love you. Just relax and be yourself. This is Blush. Everybody say hi, Blush. Hi, Blush. As you can see, she's excited to meet you all. Look, she's blushing. She has her own merch line. She gotta pay her phone bill, need a new laptop for YouTube videos, pay rent, so she can have somewhere to stay. You know, no big deal, just small stuff. If you would like to help her achieve this, link is below. She appreciates it. But um, what I recommend the show. Yeah, I'd say it's Blush Bunny approved. Season two is already out, I haven't watched yet, but I'm looking forward to see what lies ahead for these characters. I'm curious to know your thoughts. As for season one, what did you guys think of the characters? Like, what was your first impressions? Who was your favorite and why? Am I the only person who empathized with Davy? I kind of feel like I'm alone in that. <laughs> Oh, and do you think the whole you win thing was a bit much or was it just me? If you would like to see a video on season two, let me know down below. If you haven't done so already, be sure to click the like button, hop on over to that subscribe button and hit the bell. Otherwise, YouTube will never show you my videos. As always, I'm all ears. Until next time, bye.